Yo, what's poppin'? It's the hyphen. Welcome back to another episode of the Doubt Me Podcast. Today's special guest is an Olympic snowboarder, actress, and she's also the girlfriend of Ricky Glazer, pro skateboarder. Today's special guest is Janice Spiteri. Ooh, what's up, guys? Hey. I got your name right. Hey, you did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just I I didn't even pay attention to my name coming up because I was listening to all the lead up. I'm like, okay, all right, like I sound pretty cool. It's giving me lots of <laughs> lots of uh, titles here. And then aside from being an Olympic snowboarder, on your spare time, you actually skateboard a lot. Yeah, yeah. I've I've been getting really into skateboarding. Like when people ask me when I started skating, it's kind of a tough question because. I got my first skateboard when I was like seven. It was a Pikachu board from Toys R Us. It was like my seventh birthday. Yeah. And um, I would just push in a straight line up and down the street. I'd get to one side, turn around, go back the other way. Because back then, like there wasn't social media or access for me as a seven-year-old girl yeah. to like see what you actually do on a skateboard, you know? Right. Um, so I didn't do a whole lot with it. And then... So you got the board. It wasn't to be a skater. It was just like one of those fun things that people, parents buy their kids yeah. at Toys R Us. Yeah, yeah, I got it from my brothers. It was like every year they kind of gave me something cool with wheels. I got like Heelys one oh, year. That's sick. I got like a scooter one year, skateboard. So, so they just gave you a bunch of different things. That... Yeah, I guess that's yeah what you get if you're a boy and you have a younger sister. You're like, what do I get her? Something and Pikachu, wheels. you were into Pokemon? No, um, I, th I think that was probably my first time seeing Pikachu, but that's probably what they had at Toys uh. R Us, you know? Um, but yeah, I actually, I had that board for a while and I didn't really do much on yeah. it. I'd push every once in a while, I'd forget about it for years, um, right. you know, get back on it. And then my dad drove over it with his car one year, so then it was just gone and I didn't have a skateboard. And then actually when I got into snowboarding, I kind of re-got into skating at the same time. Yeah. But that was like senior year of high school and I was, I was going to the skate park every day just to compensate for not being able to go snowboarding. I was like, all I want to do is go snowboarding. All I want to do is go snowboarding. All right, this is the closest I can get to it. Where did you uh, grow up? Um, I was in the San Francisco area okay. in uh, Redwood City. Okay, so you, you pretty much no snow until wintertime. Yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't come from a family that was super into it. We'd go like one day a year basically. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, I, I did it. And then once I really got into snowboarding and had my snowboarding career with traveling like I wasn't skating at all right and then kind of this past year dating Ricky I'm around skateboarding so much that I'm just doing it all the time now and yeah. I finally hit a point where it's like I feel like there's a barrier of pushing around to then like getting your first trick right and then like once you start to unlock tricks there's like a new level of fun because now yeah. it's like oh wait i can ollie off this curb and i can try this thing on that and and so i finally hit that level where i can actually do stuff now so it's really fun yeah um so yeah i'm i'm loving skateboarding right now yeah it is it's frustrating for a while when you can't land a kickflip mm -hmm. or a shove or anything like that um it's it's still pretty fun which was why people keep doing it but then it's it definitely goes to a whole other level once you're like oh this is actually possible i yeah. could do this trick oh now maybe i could do this trick and now this trick your parents are the ones who would get you all these different like the the scooters the skateboards the all that stuff or where was it influenced more by siblings you said you have siblings yeah yeah my it was my like birthday gift for my brothers that okay I would get. so are you the young like how many siblings do you have um i'm the youngest i have two older half brothers um so i never really lived with them or anything it was kind of like i would just see them on holidays mm. and like family gatherings but they always got they're the ones that got you those gifts yeah that's yeah, dope they got me they, the were they up. into any of those sports not really like i what? don't think my brothers have ever even skateboarded so i don't know how that happened that's odd but yeah yeah i, I mean I, like that's dope but like <laughs> yeah like <laughs> I, can't, I can't even imagine like okay like i don't do it let me get you something that i don't know how to do and you have never done well that was the problem was that like i ended up with a skateboard and nobody i knew none of my family knew how to do anything with a skateboard so there's no one that could actually teach me how yeah. to do anything or show me this is what you do on it the same thing happened when i was like 13 i wanted this electric guitar for christmas my parents gave it to me but they didn't give me any lessons or anything with it and there was like they didn't know how to play guitar. So I ended up with this guitar and I'm just like, well, now I have this and I don't know what to do with it. Um, so it's one of those things like, that's here's funny. this gift. Like, I guess figure it out. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and that was before all the social media where like today, if you get a guitar for Christmas, you can go on YouTube, be like, how to play. Yeah, now you can just learn organ. online. Yeah, there wasn't anything like that. But I'll say that's really dope of your family to gift you things that they're not even aware of because at least they're allowing you to pique your own interests. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of parents and siblings won't really do that. They'll kind of just 
keep you in whatever you're comfortable with. Or like a lot of parents will be kind of too scared to let their kids try a sport that they can get hurt on, especially if they don't know how to teach them how to do it. Yeah. So that's actually really dope. Yeah, they, my parents, I think, never brought me to a skate park or never looked up any skate parks when I was little because to them, they were scared of skate parks. They thought that's where all the like druggies and like gang members Which and is like true. bad people were. <laughs> it's pretty accurate yeah, in, they, um, in some skate parks in LA. They they didn't think it was a safe place for a kid to go. So yeah. I never even like saw a skate park until yeah. I was 16. And I was like, whoa, I went for the first time and I was super nervous. I looked up on my phone like, where is the nearest skate park? And I go to it and I was so scared going. And then the guys that I met at that skate park ended up becoming like my best friends for Dope. my last year of high school. They were so cool. And then even when I went to college, like whenever I'd come back home, I'd go to the skate park and link up with them. And um, they they were such good guys. And I actually made such a good community at that skate park. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it because literally my whole life I was afraid to go to a skate park. And then yeah. the first day it was like, I was super intimidating at first. And then right away, one of the guys came up to me and was like, oh, hey, like, are you trying to work on a trick? Like, oh, let me know if you need any help. And I was like, wow, this is really welcoming. Oh, that's sick. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Most skateboarders, there's like this uh, kind of like unspoken, like family type vibe that, that we have with each other. You, you go to a different city, different state, different wherever, you go skate and, uh, it's just like this camaraderie that I haven't really experienced from any other sport that like at a, at like at a, like where someone can just go do on their own, like at a park or like when you go play basketball, or, you know, like it's very, or, or tennis or volleyball, or like any of these things, like it's very rare that people are like, Hey, like, do you need help with this? Or, Hey, you know, like that, but skateboarders are way more welcoming. Uh, when you go to a skate park and you're trying a trick and even if they don't even, if they don't know you, and then you finally land a trick, like they applaud you. Yeah. Like, that's dope. I, I love that vibe. Yeah, that's something that like I've noticed is really cool about skateboarding where you can have these guys and girls who are doing sick tricks, like really, really good stuff, um, you know, hitting rails, doing all sorts of things. And then there'll be someone who's literally just trying to like do a shove for the first time yeah. or something. And, you know, everyone's kind of like seeing like, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen this kid working on for like an hour while I'm doing, you know, like dope some shit. crazy trick. Yeah. And then like this kid finally gets a shove and all these people who like clearly a shove is the easiest trick in the world for them at this point. All of them are hyping that person. They're like, yeah, that's so sick. And like, yeah. it's really cool to see people get so stoked on someone else where like because to me, you know, I'm like, oh, man, like alling off like a two stair is such like a basic thing but at, for me it's hard for me and like these guys like they probably think it's super lame but then they're all cheering for me and so yeah. it's like it's really cool how they don't care if someone's a beginner or not you know it's kind of like yeah. respect gets respect like even if you're if you're a beginner or a newbie as long as you're kind of respecting the flow of things yeah. that are on the way like you're just as welcome there as anyone else. Facts. In the Olympics, uh, this you know, obviously the, the the last Olympics were the first Olymp the first time the skateboarding was in the Olympics. You actually saw that on TV, like which I thought was really dope. Like uh, Manny Santiago, uh, I was talking to him about it because actually there was a, a clip of him on TV being broadcasted where he's like talking to his rivals essentially, mm -hmm. right? Like in the Olympics, right? Different country, yeah. and they're just all like helping each other out. And no other sport yeah. in the Olympics, no other sport that I see that in. Where like the different countries were going to talk to each other, help th helping them out. Like, hey, you should try or hey, you're you're turning too much this mm -hmm. way. And it was like so dope. So that that's really dope. And uh, yeah, I love I love when people get hyped up and and they cheer for the other people as well. So that's skateboarding, but you are an Olympic snowboarder. Yeah. <laughs> you said you grew up in San Fr in the the Bay Area. Yeah. And none of your family snowboarded. No, um, my family skied and we went skiing like one okay, day okay. or whatever. And then you, but you just were like on your own since you had nobody else that did it. Where you were the only one that was like, I want to try snowboarding instead. Um, like, how did that come about? Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you go into like, just create your own path in that, especially when you're not in an environment that has snow all the time? Yeah. So it was probably like, I, I maybe when I was around 13, I was kind of bored with skiing because I was just there with my parents and we were just making turns down the run, making turns down the run like it wasn't exciting. And <laughs> from the chairlift, I saw the terrain park and I saw snowboarders like hitting the boxes and rails and the jumps. And I was like, whoa, that looks so cool and fun. Like, I want to try that. Yeah. And at the time, there weren't really skiers in the park. So only people I could see from the trail were snowboarders. And so I was like, all right, next time we come up, like, I want to try to snowboard. And what do your parents say to that? Um, 
Yeah, they were like, all right, yeah, cool. fine. They put me in a lesson. And um, also, like, the side reason was the boots looked really cool. Like, ski boots are, like, all hard and, like, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. cool. And, like, snowboard boots looked cool. Um, yeah. They look like skate shoes, you know. Yeah. And um, and my other reason was, like, I was like, oh, and the cute guys snowboard. There's a bunch of cute guys <laughs> at snowboard, so I want to do that. Um, so, anyways, I, like, took the lesson. It's a good reason to learn things. Yeah, you yeah. know, I just, <laughs> uh, you know, I took the lesson. I, I learned how to turn yeah. and stuff. And, um Prior to senior year of high school, though, I only had snowboarded maybe three or four days total. Um, and then it was summer before senior year. This is like the wildest story. When when you look back on your life and there's certain things where you're like, oh, this was the moment, like a significant choice was made where something could have gone completely one way or the other. Right. Like I can trace my entire experience with snowboarding to like this a moment, specific moment. Um, it's. We're in like beginning of July. I'm supposed to be doing my summer reading list or whatever. And I procrastinate looking Go, at Facebook. Going into senior year? Yeah, going into senior year. And um, I get onto Facebook to procrastinate. Of course. <laughs> and um, Facebook had like just started doing like sidebar advertisements. Mm -hmm. And I see an advertisement for summer snowboard camp. And I was like, what the heck? That sounds super cool. Summer snowboard camp. And um, it was winding down to the end of the summer. I was in a musical performing on stage and there was going to be like exactly a week between... Musical in school? Uh, like a, a regular like professional theater musical. Oh, sick. Because um, I, I did theater my whole life. I did so many things growing up. I know. Um, but yeah, so like there was going to be like a week before it, that ended and I had to get back to school. And so I started Googling like snowboard camps. Is there anything that fits in? Once you saw once you saw the ad. Yeah, because I didn't even know that existed. Like, did you know summer snowboarding existed? I did not know till now. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, this is crazy. And because um, the original ad was for one in New Zealand because they have reverse seasons. Oh, it's nice. Um, but I started doing research online. I found up in Oregon, there's a glacier up there that has snowboard camps, skiing snowboard camps in the summer. Um, so I looked between... Okay, the, so, so the snowboard uh, summer camps are not here. They're not in like California. No, okay, up okay. in Oregon though. Okay. Yeah. So um, I found two camps and one of them had a session that fit in perfectly in that one week that I had free before I had to go back to school. Oh, wow. And um, so I like called my parents. I was like, hey, I'm signing up for, for snowboard camp. Um, I need you guys to do it with your credit card. Like I have cash. I'll give you the cash for the camp. Um, Damn, and I'll, I'll get like, my flight. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I had been saving some money. And so I was like, I'm going to this camp. I will pay for it. You can't say no if I'm paying for it, right? Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to pay for the camp. I'll pay for the flight. I just need you guys to use your credit card and sign up. And but you called them. Where were they? Uh, they were back home. I think I was like at rehearsals for oh, okay. the uh, oh, okay. musical. Gotcha. I was like there in the theater like gotcha. doing rehearsals while I was like, oh, snowboard camp. And um, so anyways, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You found some summer camp online. Like we're not just going to send you to it. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Like you're like, like a, I don't know, what was I, 16 years old. Um, they didn't want to send me on a plane off to somewhere else. But I convinced them and I went. And that week was my first time seeing that there was a whole snowboard industry and people had career snowboarding because as far as I knew, it, it, skiing and snowboarding is something you did one day a winter with your family just for vacation. And that yeah. was it. Like, I didn't know that. There's a whole industry. Yeah, I had no idea. And so I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I got obsessed with it. And I was like, I want to just travel the world and snowboard all year, like snowboard all over the world. And then this is when you went to the camp or when you were just looking it up? This was like after my experience at the camp. Okay, so at the camp, after having gone. Yeah, because at the camp, I met pro snowboarders. I met people who worked yeah. in the industry and I was like, whoa, this is, they were all really fun people. So I was like, this is so cool. Yeah. It's fun, parties, free stuff. And guys. Guys, cute guys. <laughs> cute guys who can do flips, you know, so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, it was like my whole world was just like blown. And so yeah. senior of high school, all of a sudden I like scrapped my other plans I had for life and was like, I need to be a pro snowboarder. I need to travel the world. I need to like do this and go after this. And um, so yeah, from having only done it like four days in my life to like yeah. being like, this is what I need to do. So your parents, you said they were like, not sure about letting you go. Yeah. The, what was the thing that they changed their mind with? I don't know. I guess I was just showing them the website and I like somehow proved to them that, that it was it, legit. Yeah, it like really existed and I wasn't just going to like, you know, <laughs> just, disappear. Yeah. <laughs> like it's valid. I mean, uh, but yeah, so that was like my first flight. And I you took flew out there by yourself? Yeah, going up to Portland. So that was, yeah. That's awesome. That was big. And then, uh, so you came back 
what what like how did you continue snowboarding how did you end up kind of building your career yeah well because because so, out here in california for those who don't know like it we don't really have seasons mm -hmm. like it rains on occasion um but it, it's mostly summer yeah. all year round it's like hot and yeah. like sunny yeah well so that's when i like got into skateboarding when i came back and i was like all right i need to find a skate park because they had skate parks at the summer camp and so that was my first time like learning to kick turn i was like oh this is pretty cool like i'm gonna find a skate park at home so um, senior of high school, I started going to the skate park every day. I Did could. you feel snowboarding and skateboarding were similar? Because I skateboarding for a bunch of years, the first time I went snowboarding, I thought they were similar. So I tried <laughs> doing the same body movements that would work on a skateboard and nothing that I did in skateboarding worked in snowboarding and I got wrecked so <laughs> bad. Did, to you, did was it like a similar transition? Were they, or are or, they, or, or, um, like am I tripping that they are different? No, they're they're pretty different. It was mainly as close as I could get. Like at one point, I took um I had some cuts of leather and I drilled them into my skateboard to make like foot slots to like shove my shoes into on my skateboard so oh, that I was like attached to it like a snowboard and so I could like jump off the ledges with like my board attached to <laughs> 180s and I was like oh this is cool and then all the guys I was skating with were like yo that's so sketchy like you're gonna eat and so that then sounds, yeah, sounds kinda, dangerous. yeah they kind of got into my head and I was like oh wait maybe I shouldn't do this like yeah. <laughs> but um yeah no it was just as close as it as I could get yeah but it, it's really a whole different thing right yeah. like, like yeah it's uh it's funny because like the similarities as far as like being in a board slide or something like that or like doing some sort of grind it's like the same in the grind but to get into it it's the different. not being attached part is like mm -hmm. the big difference because it's like i feel like um with ricky he's been snowboarding a lot with me this past year and he kind of had trouble with the board at first like he was like, I can't go straight. I can't go straight. He just couldn't go straight flat base down the mountain. Yeah, and, that's the same here. Yeah, but then he'd go towards a rail and he'd do like a front board on a rail. And he's like, well, the board side feels the same. And I'm like, yeah, as soon as you actually figure out how to use the board itself, yeah. it's going to be crazy because once you're on the rails or whatever, it's that, it's that translates thing. similar. Yeah, yeah, that translates. It's just like actually being able to make turns and stay on your feet. Yeah. Um, but all the skateboarders I know freak out about snowboarding just because they're like, you can't bail out. Like you can't jump <laughs> away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got wrecked the first time I tried snowboarding. Like I tried going on like one of the like the more medium to advanced mountains mm -hmm. like on my first day. Uh because I was like, oh, I got the hang of the bunny hill quickly. And it just I like I literally got the biggest bruise on my whole side hip to like from like my like at my, my whole ash cheek too was like all purple <laughs> like my hip and like i was literally limping for like five days after because i just got wrecked i was like it took me over an hour to get down because every like three seconds i would just wreck <laughs> and then i'd go down <laughs> and then at one point i even like i couldn't control it i couldn't figure out how to stop how to slow down nothing i was it was so mm -hmm. stupid and i ended up there was like this kid who had fallen uh and I couldn't stop. I ran right into I I damn near like killed this guy. Oh my God. It was terrible. I felt so bad. Yeah, I feel um, like if you're okay, I get the question with people who are like, I'm about to go to the mountains for the first time. Should I ski or snowboard? And I say if you're just going for like one day, just ski because your first day on skis, you're gonna be able to make it down a run on your feet and you'll just have more fun when you get to stay on your feet and actually yeah. like actually like do the the uh activity you know like <laughs> yeah. like you're not really snowboarding when you're yeah. just falling every time you stand up but um if you really do want to learn to snowboard i would highly suggest taking a lesson your first day yeah um lessons i know aren't like really the thing to do in skateboarding but with snowboarding since there's the technique of how to actually turn and stuff just doing a one-day lesson where you can have someone show you how to do it without falling then go off and do your own yeah. thing. But yeah, it's not fun if you're just done. tumbling yeah. down the <laughs> Oh yeah, it was, it was horrible. You started skateboarding to kind of like just give you the your 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 fix, yeah. essentially, right? That you're yeah. fiending for on the snowboard. But like, so then like, how did you continue snowboarding living in the Bay? Did you move? Did you, what like, what, how, what was that course? And what kind of took you to that level of snowboarding? Yeah, so that like senior year of high school, um, I wanted to go up to Tahoe more, which is like three and a half hours from where I live. Um, and my parents didn't want me to drive up there because they were like, oh, there's snow on the roads. You know, you just start driving and it's not safe. And so I found this Bay Area ski bus that for like $110 would drive you to the mountain and you'd get your lift ticket with it. 
and you'd have to meet at a parking lot at like 4 a.m. They drive up to the mountain. You ride from like nine till three. You meet back at the bus like three. They drive you back and you get off the bus like 11 p.m. Like, damn, it was like a long day, like 4 a.m. to 11. But I found the ski bus. And so I told my parents like, hey, I signed up for the ski bus like I paid for it, you know. Um, So I got to go a few more days doing that, um, just going up alone on this bus full of strangers. That's crazy. Uh, But I, I guess like as far as even like my whole career, it's been something where it's like if I want to do something like I really want to snowboard, it's like, well, okay, you can't drive there. You don't have rides. You don't have friends who are going like, well, there's this bus that I can take. There's this, there's this. Like I always find some sort of way to like, make these things happen so yeah and this was all still during senior year or yeah just, okay. during senior year like on the weekends um so i went a few times and then i went to college up in the mountains like my original plan had been to go to college in southern california all the schools that i toured were down here um because i grew up acting i started working in acting when i was like three years old i wow. think um maybe two I think my first agent, I was like two years old. Um, what? Yeah. That's so, crazy. so I did that my You're whole life. Gerber? Were you a Gerber baby? <laughs> okay. I did. Uh, I did some little kid like Macy's ads and Same. stuff. And, um, but yeah, like I had always wanted to pursue acting. And so I so was. So that was the original plan. Yeah. And so the original plan was to come to Southern California. I toured the Southern California schools. This was the plan. And then senior year, it was like, oh, wait, like acting or snowboarding. And. I figured my only chance to see if I can make it as a snowboarder is jumping into it right now because I was already going to be 18 my first year. Right. And most people started snowboarding when they're like they're four. Younger. You know, yeah. I, I already had a lot of time to make up for. It. And then I was like, well, I can always come back to acting. And like, at least I'll know I, I tried the snowboard thing. Yeah. So I ended up applying to a bunch of mountain town schools, um, Colorado, Boulder, University of Utah and Sierra Nevada up in Lake Tahoe. And I ended up going to Sierra Nevada. And so that next year when I was 18 was my first year of living in the mountains. And I will never forget waking up the first like snow day, waking up in my dorm and seeing snow outside my bedroom window. I was like, oh my God, I'm in the snow. Like, and then, and then some of the kids set up like little like grind boxes and stuff just on the lawn of the college, like right outside the dorms. And I was like, this is insane. Like, I can't believe this is actually happening. It was like dream come true. How often would you say then you were snowboarding out there? Yes. So, um, once I was there, I was going like every day possible. I think my first season, because I went up to Mount Hood again for the summer. So I had like all winter and the summer. I think I had over a hundred days of riding like that first year. So I went from yeah. like, <laughs> oh at that God. point, maybe like eight days in my life to yeah. like a hundred in that first year. That's sick. Um, and I, well, I, I took the spring semester off of school too. The reason I went to Sierra Nevada was because I wanted to be on their snowboard team. And so I show up in the fall and I found the coach. I was like, hey, I want to be on your snowboard team. Like you're the best snowboard team in the country. Like if I'm going to have a career in snowboard, like college snowboarding, this is important. I had no idea that college snowboarding means nothing in the world of snowboarding. But coming from fully outside that world, I was like, yeah, like NFL, you know, the college teams is what right, is right. important. The NBA, all of it is like based on college. So I was like, I have to be on this college snowboard team. And they're like, well, what's your competition history? We need to see your results. And I was like, oh, well, I've never done a contest. And they're like, you can't just be on the team. And so I was like, all right, I won't go to school for the spring. I'm going to live at the mountain. I'm just going to do every single competition I can. Wow. And so I did that. I moved to the mountain. I entered all the contests I could. I basically learned how to do all of my tricks in competitions. Like, wow. I showed up to my first slope style contest and I had hit maybe like a five foot jump. And this first contest was like a 20 foot jump and a 30 foot jump. And I'm standing there. I'm like, well, I guess this is the day that I have to learn to do this because I'm in the competition. Like, Man, that's crazy. I'll hit the biggest what jump pressure. I've ever done. Yeah, but like, I don't know. I kind of thrive on, on it because any other day on the mountain, you can be like, well, not today. Like, I'll hit this jump. Maybe tomorrow will be right. better. Maybe, oh, it's a little windy. Oh, I feel a little funny today. You can always find an excuse. Right. But when you're there at a competition, like, what you do you do? You have to go. Yeah. Yeah. So I literally like I'd go to a rail jam and I only knew how to do a 50 50 land my 50 50. I'm like, well, it's 20 minutes left. I guess uh, I'll try a front lip. OK, I do that. All right. I guess I'll try 180 off. Now, All right, now, did that. Like, <laughs> I'm curious. OK, that that's incredible, by the way. That's to, to push yourself to that level was amazing. But I'm curious to know, like having really just learning tricks while you're in competition, I'm guessing the 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 factor for injury or the, the potential for getting wrecked is high because you're really just trying something kind of almost for the first time. 
how often did you get wrecked in these competitions trying something that you've never done before? Not really ever. You know, wow. like as okay, skateboarders always think that snowboard like slams look so bad, but usually they're not too bad. Like when we hit the ground, it's it's usually okay. So yeah, I like take some tumbles every yeah. once in a while, taco some rails. But nothing wrecked. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 I mean, that just speaks to at least how natural you were on the board as well. Because yeah. I've tried things and I get wrecked on the smallest things. <laughs> like I remember I tried like doing like this 50-50 on this little box and I got wrecked time after time and it was tiny. It was crazy. You know, and I could like... 50 a hubba rail yeah. uh, you know like it's crazy i mean there um, was there was blood and stuff like there's damn. a time i have an old facebook picture where like my whole chin is all bloody and like still without makeup my chin is like kind of pink because i went off a jump i was planning to do a front side 360 and then and this was like the first year where i'm just like kind of going for going stuff for and it. as i take off i'm like oh wait maybe i should do a 180 but i had already in the set a little, already yeah i had already set kind of too hard and then i was like wait, oh, I'm going to pass one A. Should I just go for three? And oh, I never no. decided and just landed 270 and just like slammed oh. my face into the snow and just like tore all my skin off. Um, So yeah, yeah there's there's yeah, stuff yeah. like that, you know, bruises and things and, That's you know, crazy. biting my lipo and just having like, I like, I, I thought it was really sick my first year snowboarding that I actually, I guess I bled a lot because, <laughs> because one of my things I thought was funny was like, oh yeah, it's sick to like ride by these guys standing and like checking out a jump line and just like spit blood into the snow in front of them <laughs> and they go hit it. Like that was something that I liked doing. So thinking back, yeah, it, I it must It was like have, a, like battle wounds. Yeah. I must have <laughs> cut my face open and like bit my cheeks a lot because I significantly remember like multiple times, like just having blood in my mouth and like spitting into the snow and being like, yeah, this is badass. <laughs> <laughs> so now forcing yourself to do all these contests did you win any yeah well so the division i was in it was like the kind of entry level like competition bracket or whatever you know that like wasn't x games it was like right for yeah kind of just the the am division and um so i was in my age group i was doing open or anything um but i did the whole competition series and by the end of the season i earned a place in nationals for like all five disciplines. So it was half pipe, slope style, border cross, giant slalom and regular slalom. I just did everything um, wow. because the college team did all the events. So I was like, I'll show them. Yeah. So I do all the things. And um, I, I remember the coolest thing was telling my dad like, hey, I got invited to nationals out in Colorado because all the competitions I was doing were just in Tahoe, it, local. Yeah, local. So I was like, whoa, I got invited to nationals in Colorado. Um, like, do you want to come where it's, it's a week long. And so my dad came with me, we got a little lodge there in the village and I podium my first event. I podium my second event, podium my third event. And midway through the week, my dad goes, wow, you really were serious about this thing. Like, this is amazing. You're on the podium for all the events. And I was like, yeah, of course I'm serious about it. Like I said, I was moving to Tahoe to like make a career as a snowboarder. Of course. Like, what did you think I was doing? He's like, oh, I thought you were just going to go to Tahoe and, you know, party, like you go to college, <laughs> party, mess around for a few yeah. years. And I was like, no, I said I was going to do this. So I'm going to do it. And so I ended up podiuming in all my events. I got third, like all around for the 18 to 22 year olds in the country. And, um, and yeah, that was like, the first moment that I was actually able to prove like, yes, like, like I'm this serious. Is, this is possible. This, you're, yeah. you're, you're doing it. Yeah. And so after that, like my parents were more supportive because they, they definitely both my mom and my dad thought I just kind of was going to mess around for a and, year. And they didn't know, like, yeah. just like how you didn't know that there was a whole world here. They yeah. probably didn't know that either. So like yeah. to them, it's like, Oh, it's just something people do for fun. Well, yeah. And it's, it's fair as a parent where like all of a sudden, at 17 someone's like i love this thing i want my life to be about this thing like in most cases they're probably gonna be obsessed with it or crazy about it for a year or two and, and then, then, and then, and then move on most, but most of the time it's a phase for people yeah yeah, yeah. it's not a phase mom it's a lifestyle <laughs> um, but yeah so i like prove like no i'm serious i'm working yeah. hard i am like training i'm doing this myself and so then like after that my parents kind of like respected the drive and respected the hustle a little bit more and um yeah that's sick yeah because i think sometimes like in life like no one's going to respect that you're going for something unless you prove that you really are working for it right you know like like oh you want to be a rapper like whatever but like then you put out music video and you're like actually putting out produced songs and like 
then people go, oh, yeah, oh, okay, like you weren't you weren't just like BSing and like wasting time, like you really want this. Facts. Yeah, I think most people talk. So when other people hear someone talk about something that not many people follow through with, it becomes one of those things where like, yeah, sure, of course mm-hmm. you're gonna do it. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. You know. And then you, the only way, yeah, like you said, is you perfectly you put it. Uh, that was so well put. It's you show them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, here, bang, bang, yeah. bang, and you keep showing them until everyone else starts to believe what you believe. Yeah, because that's the thing. It's like if you if you are waiting for other people to believe in you to get started, like it's never gonna happen. Like, yeah. I, so many times I had so many people doubt me. Haha, <laughs> doubt me. Nice. Um, I had so many people like doubt me and hate on me or like put me down for like wanting to go after this dream. And I realized like through the process and in hindsight that the only reason I made it is because I was always my own biggest cheerleader that no matter yeah. if everyone else was like, it's not gonna happen, it's not possible. At the end of the day, I was still saying, you're gonna do this. You yeah. can do this. You will do this. And oh, another obstacle comes in the way. Well, break that sucker down. Like yeah. you have to make it through. Like don't let anything or anyone else stop you because I'm the only one in control of my actions. Like if I stop just because someone else tells me I can't do something, like they're not living my life. Like yeah. why am I letting someone else control my destiny? Yeah, there's this uh, great quote that I heard um, from this motivational speaker. He said, if you ever want to be a champion at something, don't ask someone who's not one how to become Mm -hmm. one. So if Mm -hmm. they're not doing the things that you want to do, then their opinions of thinking that you can't or it's not possible or whatever, they're irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, that's that's awesome that you have been able to stay focused and just go, go, go and just continue to progress, believe in yourself. And the way you said being your, you you have to be your biggest cheerleader. That's Mm -hmm. facts. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to eat all the shit, you know, struggle, fall, lose, Mm -hmm. and just keep going and keep going. And if you continue, there's pretty much guaranteed progression. Mm -hmm. So long as you just continue, you continue. Yeah, Yeah, Um, And I I don't want to like make it out to be a fairy tale like oh if you just oh, no, keep doing it everything's gonna work out yeah there's so many times where like i wanted to quit i was in tears like i was questioning what i was doing with my life like there's so many like really low moments along yeah. the way that like i had to persevere through um because it's like oh if i let that low moment make me quit then everything i already did was for nothing you know facts so but like yeah like along the way it sucks like the climb is hard yeah there are in total more losses than wins Mm -hmm. but when you get those wins those wins are so big Mm -hmm. if if you continue Mm -hmm. um like i i for for me at least i've definitely lost way more times than i've won but when i win it's like oh my god like i got here now Mm -hmm. now i can go here to this next step after that um what would you say to tell me about one of maybe your lowest lows oh okay the worst one this was probably like the worst moment in my life was um was when i missed the 2018 olympics um i had been you know pushing for it um i had changed my my citizenship or gone dual citizenship to the country my dad's family is from malta in like 2014. Where's that at? Um, it's an island south of Italy. Oh, okay. And um, so I'd been representing Malta. My grandparents came from there and um, my my grandparents had both passed away like my first season in the mountains and um, they owned an ice skate boot company. My, my nun knew manufactured ice skating boots and like Michelle Kwan wore his boots and like all these like really wow. top figure skaters wore his ice skates like in the Olympics. And so... I kind of, there was this personal thing for me where like he supported all these Olympic athletes like from the US and all over the world. And like now I'm gonna represent his country and like, you know, be able to like bring it back home for him after, you know, he immigrated after World War II and all this. So so anyways, I'd been competing for Malta as Malta's like first ever snowboarder. um, So I was in all the events for them. Yeah, and and so. And and, and real quick on that. You're you were born out here yeah just by getting a citizenship you're allowed to compete in their olympics um so uh, to represent them in the olympics yeah you can represent if you 
the basic rule is like you have to have a passport for another country and then there's a process that the country has to do within the governing body to change your citizenship because i had already been competing um in world cups and the grand prix like for the u.s mm -hmm. um and so they had to go through process of like releasing me from the u.s the u.s had to agree to like let me compete for another country and, and what made you what made you make that decision to go from like trying to be the u.s to malta it was kind of like olympics based where i this whole process i had never considered going to the olympics i it just wasn't in my sphere of what my dream was my dream was to just snowboard around the world and yeah. like i was competing i had started to like travel and get invited to the like pro contest for the u.s and so i was doing that and then one of my college teammates we were talking about you know where our families were from and stuff and he was like wait you have family from another country like why don't you go to the olympics and i was like what like that's not thing he's like yeah like you can go to the olympics and i'm like that's dope and I, I didn't had, even I didn't even know that I had never thought about it. Um, and there's still like there's still qualifications that you have to meet where some sports get um, every country gets like a designated spot in. Um, but snowboarding and actually skateboarding also because um, I was looking up skateboarding regulations and stuff where you still have to be within this like top 24 in the world. Right. Um, and it's not just like, oh, that country doesn't have anyone. So they get in like you still have to like you have to compete and qualify. Yeah. And so. I was going through all the qualifications for 2018 and I was like right on the cusp. I was, I was like 23rd, 24th and they take the top 24. And so I'd been 23rd, 24th, like sitting in this spot where it's like, all right, if I keep going to the competitions, I keep making my points and I stay in. And I go to New Zealand the year of the Olympics. It's in August. We had a qualifier out there and um, four competitions left till the Olympics. My first day in New Zealand, third run of the first day, I blow my knee out. Ugh. and I knew in that instant, like, I, I just sent it huge off of a jump. I missed the entire landing. Like, I literally, like, I was supposed to be in New Zealand for 10 weeks, and third run of my first day, like, not even an hour into being at the mountain. Uh. Um, I think it had gone a little bit colder. The jump kind of froze up a bit, and I went in with the same speed I had before, but this time I just, like, accelerated off of the takeoff, and I just missed the entire landing. I fell probably, like, 20 feet vertical from the sky just oh, onto my snaps. feet and i tried to land on my feet and my knee just popped and it, <sighs> like in that moment i was like i blew my knee out yeah, oh my god and <laughs> up until that point like my whole thing was like as long as you don't get injured before the olympics you're in like just don't get injured you're good Damn. and so i was like oh my god i just lost the olympics like everything i've been doing for years and years and years because it's a lot of work do keeping up with the training and the traveling and like it's stressful and hard work and i was like everything like just like disappeared in this one moment and um so i was in ski patrol and one of the ski coaches i knew came by and he was like hey you know at sochi at the 2014 games there were like three skiers with blown out knees this isn't the end like you can still ride with it, your knee blown out and i was like really what the hell like i i can still do this with my blown out knee and so then I was like, okay, I have some hope. I have some hope. Like I spent two weeks just like on crutches or walking, doing physical therapy, got back on snow. I was like, okay, I can still snowboard. And I had an Olympic qualifier the next week. So I waited until the day of the competition to do any spins. I survived the contest. I fly back home. Yeah, so you therapy. still competed. I still competed. Wow. Um, the the one bad thing was I didn't get to do like any of the training leading up to it. I just kind of like went out cold turkey. And um, so anyways, that season, I fought so hard and I was in so much pain every day. I was taking like four ibuprofen in the morning. <sighs> like a few hours later, I'd take another four up Damn. at the half pipe because I had this mentality where it's like, it was do or die. I was like, I have to do this. I have to. And I'm in so much pain. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what my knee is feeling. I need to do these tricks i and, need and to the do this. uh the doctors everyone they were just saying it's, it's okay well or they didn't know <laughs> um you know so <laughs> i guess i hadn't really talked to any doctors out here um about it i just did research online and it was like yeah you can do physical activities with your acl torn but you <laughs> could do you could do long-term damage like you could permanently damage your knee, knee and end up with um was like not arthritis but uh like tendonitis or something yeah. like you can you can do like permanent damage but i was like it's worth it like wow. if my knee is effed up for the rest of my life like it's the olympics wow. like i am making this sacrifice like i don't care about my knee i have to do this and i i rode great that year i landed my first crippler which is like um 
a frontside 540 with the backflip in it, like my first, you know, upside down inverted trick. I was I was riding great. I felt good. Wait, you did this with the yeah. blown out knee? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so you know how I was saying that? all the way up to the Olympics, I was like, just don't get hurt. Yeah. So my thing with the crippler was like, okay, I'm flipping upside down towards the middle of the pipe. Like I could like break my back or something. So I never tr like actually tried it. But then once my knee was torn with that trick and with everything else, I was like, well, what's going to happen? I get hurt and I have to get surgery. I'm already going to have to get surgery. <laughs> like I'm already, like I'm already broke off. So like, what does it matter now? Like there's no yeah. staying safe. Don't get hurt. Cause I'm already hurt. Yeah. Just go for broke now. Yeah. So I was going for it. And, um, it, it, man, it got to the point by the end of the season, I was literally like falling to the ground, like trying to walk to the chairlift, but I was like, I have to go, I have to go. And so I come out of the last competition, I placed like 14th in it. It was like my best world cup finish. And, um, wow. I, I was sitting your best world cup finish with a blown out. Yeah. Knee. Cause I like literally like You're my, a beast. my brain shut off like everything. I was like, I have to go. I was so hungry for the Olympics. And meanwhile, you know, everyone in Malta, all my family back there is going, oh, Janice yeah. going to the Olympics. My family here is telling everyone they know I'm going to the Olympics. I've <sighs> told everyone that I'm going to the Olympics. Damn. I'm like, I have to go. And so I come out of this last competition in 25th in the rankings. And my coach was saying, oh, you're good. You're set because the countries have to accept the spots. And usually there's always a few that for one reason or another, they say, well, okay, we earned three spots, but we're only going to use two of them. Or, you know, we, this person does that metal potential. So we're not going to send them at all. Like, cause different countries have their own criteria of, mm. of what makes an athlete eligible to like be sent to the Olympics. And so there's always, there's always a few that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, there, there'd be some spots. room. Yeah. And so my coach, like you're one spot out, like you're set. All you need is the one spot. And at that last competition, two of the French girls were like injured. One was in the hospital with an ankle injury. Canada had announced two of their girls weren't going to be going. So I was like, oh, there are multiple spots open. And so when the invite list, it's it's on a uh, website where it shows like at a certain time that the invites have gone out to the countries. And then in real time, as countries accept them, the list gets updated with like, these spots have been accepted. These have been rejected. And so I'm sitting there as the list comes out to refresh, 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 waiting to see you know, the one spot open up because I only needed the one spot and I'm refreshing and refreshing. Canada comes in. They accepted all their spots and they had announced that they weren't taking two of yeah. them, but now they've taken all of them. All right, France. Oh, that girl must not be that injured. They took both of their spots. Like, well, uh, like China it might only send people that they think are going to make finals. Maybe one of their girls isn't good enough. Boom, China accepted all their spots. And I'm refreshing. And as the hours are taking, like, I didn't leave my house because they have, like, a window of, like, 48 hours to accept. And I sat there on my computer just refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And, like, as the countries came in, my heart started sinking and sinking. And it comes down to the last country. I don't remember what it was, but there was, like, one final spot. And I refresh. And that moment scene, they took the spot. There was no, no open, like, alternative list coming up. It Damn. was like all of a sudden, it was just like the most gutted, defeated, empty, terrible feeling. Like I fell apart. Like it, it was personal, like personally devastating after all the work I put in and with my knee blown out and I put myself through so much pain and I worked so hard and I had my best finish ever and I only needed to be one spot higher on that list. And it's like, man, if I had gotten to train for the week in New Zealand, if I hadn't blown my knee out right there and I actually got to train and I placed a spot or two higher, could that have been the point difference to put me into that last spot? Like it was such a small thing. Um, you know, here or there at a competition, like, oh, the judges scored me wrong. I should have placed, I should have been a, you know, 22nd at this one instead of a 24th. Like those little tiny differences resulted in this and and it wasn't just like feeling devastated for myself, but because everyone in the world who knew me, yeah, all the everyone thought I was going. So then it was like, I had to like announce that I wasn't going. Yeah. And that, so it was like terrible because I couldn't even just deal with the devastation myself. You had to go and face everybody else. Yeah, face everyone and, as and, a failure, and, basically, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, you weren't, but like that's the, in that position is mm -hmm. the only thing that you would, naturally feel yeah. you would yeah. feel that so it's not you you weren't a failure because yeah. it was still amazing what you did yeah but yeah like going and talk to someone tell them like hey i can't do it like 
internally right. there's no other way that you would pr- like be able to to yeah. make yourself not think that yeah. you know and, it, I mean? and it was only like this list comes out like a week before the olympics so i had fully been preparing to go to korea like for the olympics because yeah. it wasn't until a week before that i found out i wasn't and um then like during the opening ceremonies you know family friends are texting my parents like oh we looked for janice in the in the ceremonies we didn't see her like and it's like well because yeah. i'm not there and um so how was so devastating um and it was terrible for you know a week or two and then it was like well all right china four more years like because it, it wasn't a question in my mind of like well i guess you gave it a try it's done it was like i put so much into you must go to the olympics that my my brain got so single tracked on that that it was like well all right four more years here we go here comes the next one and it's just back to business but um well it wasn't back to business i went home i finally got knee surgery um seven months after blowing my knee out i finally got my acl replaced and then i had to do the rehab for all that and then i was back to like grinding (laughs) but then you had to like kind of start from uh, was it a slow process to get back with having that severe of an injury yeah um it was. Uh, I had to rebuild the strength in my knee. It was all kind of weak. And I had kind of hurt the other one a little bit by compensating so mm. hard onto the other one the whole time. So I was just kind of in a bad place with my knee. Um, but And then I was having pain. I was having these mystery pains that I've had for the last four years since my last knee surgery. I keep getting these sharp pains in my knee that would literally floor me with the pain. Like, oh my God, what was that? Like, just like an electric shock or a knife through the side of my knee. And I was like, I cannot let this stupid freaky knee get in the way of the Olympics again. Like, ignore the pain again. Um, That season, Missing the Olympics 2018, taught me a huge lesson was that it showed me how much I can face as far as, like, pain. How much you can handle. Yeah, because, you know, before, like... I might go up a day and be like, oh yeah, my ankle is kind of sore. Like this is kind of sore. And I realized like from being in real true pain with like my knee just being fully like toasted, like my knee was done. I couldn't even walk half the time. I, and I pushed through that and persevered through that. So after that, I was like, well, anything that hurts, I know I can just like compartmentalize it. And it's like, yeah. I, I know what I faced really at the extent of what I can face. So it, it gave me a, a good perspective of being that's a able dangerous to. game too because if you like i mean your your body's in pain it's telling you something something's wrong so like if you kind of like just think oh i can handle this i can handle that you're gonna have more long-term negative effects on your body because you're just you're abusing it yeah well so, you know you know as a skater you yeah. know what it's like you tumble down that well, stair set say, so many times like, and you go oh, no <laughs> that was me all the time i would like get myself broken bad and my whole ankle to my calf was fat and I couldn't even move my, my foot, but I would like be so pissed that I couldn't yeah. skate that I still started riding and trying to do shoves at least. Cause I was just yeah. like, no, I'm not going to be injured like stupidly. Or, you know, but, that trick that you were so close to and you're like, man, I can barely move right now, but I'm so close to it. I have to get yeah. it. It's maybe like, we're all a little bit crazy or something, yeah. but it's like, <laughs> it's yeah. like, cause I'm like aware, you know, this pain is my body telling me it's, not good but yeah. like screw it like i'm just gonna like <laughs> yeah. like mental game it through it yeah yeah there's this crazy stupidity with our resilience as like um uh, extreme sports athletes you know um and i wouldn't even consider myself an athlete because I, I didn't go like crazy <clears throat> you know with a career with it but uh i definitely did some stuff that was kind of i would say it's pretty dope for me and uh i got i definitely got wrecked many times yeah. and just kept going and kept going until then i'd be like in extreme amounts of pain or for however long but i was like oh but i got that clip yeah but i got that clip and then i'd be like so happy well and what i think is like so that experience with your skateboarding and the experience with snowboarding like as far as looking at our lives outside these sports any sort of other career or project or passion you're going to go after you know what it's like to fail and fail and fail and be in pain and like you know how to get back up again get back up again so I think this is something that's such a real world lesson that you get Facts. from snowboarding or skating, scootering, BMXing, like any of these things where we fall constantly and we fail constantly. We realize that we have the strength and the power yeah. to keep going. Mm-hmm. In life outside of our sport, it's like, oh, okay, it's not as bad as taking all these slams. So I can keep going. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think 
most normal people pursuing careers or whatever, they don't know what it's like to be in that much pain or to fail that hard or like trying a skate trick. This blows my mind because with snowboarding tricks, I have never had to do as many tries to get a, a trick as it does with skating. Yeah. And like skating, it's normal to try a trick like 150 times before you get it. Like, yeah, it's like, crazy. It's crazy. And like I've never failed that many times. And <laughs> like <laughs> like you have to like like to fail over and over again so many times. Um, I think is it, that's not an experience you get anywhere else. Like any other thing, you try something five times and you fail five times and go, well, I yeah, guess, yeah, I, guess I, I can't do, do it. it or it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not in the cards for me, yeah. but for us, it's like, you come from skating. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. only five times. Give me like 150 <laughs> more tries. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I'm only going to say it's one more try. One more try. I've got oh, it. One more. Yeah. Yeah. The one more <laughs> one try. More. That's always a th thousand more tries. It's the worst. But I think that's the mindset you always have to have that any try could be, be the, the one, one more. It could be that one more. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> so what's the thing that kind of just like snapped you out of that low? Man, it's like, okay, you know the scene in Spongebob where like, okay, so Spongebob and they live in Bikini Bottom. It's yeah. all nice. And then there's that other city, Rock Bottom, right. that you don't see. And it's just, there's like a big cliff that just drops off. And yeah. like, there's Rock Bottom. It's dark. And it's just like, it was like, I literally just dropped and like back flopped into like Rock Bottom where it felt like my like stomach and my heart and everything had just sink into this low where it was like, I don't want to move. I don't want to do anything. Like, what is the point of anything? Like, what? Like, you were like, heartbroken. To the point of like, yeah. Like, what? Why am I even living? Like, I literally just like shattered. Yeah, emotionally, like, fully, fully, just like, yeah. I just felt like everything was like sucked into like a pit of just nothingness. Where I'm like, this is like, this is terrible. Um, the thing that got me out of bed. The only reason I like stood up was because I had been doing my YouTube channel. Um, I started my YouTube channel to show like my journey to the 2018 Olympics. So every Olympic qualifier, I made a vlog of like, all right, here we are in China. Here we are in Spain. This is like this place. Um, so I was showing the whole road to the Olympics. How often were you posting on your YouTube at this point? Um, it was just like at each event. So each competition. Okay. So um because that was my thing. I just wanted to like show yeah. show the journey to the Olympics, and I thought when the when the last video happened, I thought then the next one would be announcing I was going to the Olympics, and then I was gonna like make content from the Olympics and stuff. And so I'm in bed. I'm like, well, I have to get on YouTube and make a video saying I didn't make it because people have been watching this and. Um, I said in the video, like at one point I said, like, you know, the only reason I'm even out of bed right now is to make this video and like this YouTube channel is kind of the reason I had to pick myself how, back how, up. So you were only active really on the stops. Uh, did you have like consistent viewers, subscribers, stuff like that? Um, or like, were you uploading so far and few between is mostly the people in your circles? Um, I think I was doing pretty good. I probably had like maybe like seven or 8,000 views on each video. I had okay, maybe yeah, that, like, that, yeah, that's good. I probably had, I, I think at that point, like so there were people waiting five or six to see more people. content. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too, is that I was like, man, now all these people online have been following and like, they're expecting to see me at the Olympics. And so I kind of made this teary video talking about how like I felt so terrible that I had failed and, um, you know, it, it just all the terrible stuff and I didn't make it and I have to make this announcement. And, um, you, the comments came in on the video, like you didn't fail. Like you did so amazing. Like next. you've got it like 2022, like you've got it. Like yeah. you're going to go to the next one. You're going to go to the next one. And it was like, okay, wait, people aren't mad at me for not making it. Cause I thought people were going to be so really? mad at me that I didn't go because I had like led them on into thinking. So like, I know you internally felt you let people down, but you thought people would be disappointed in you. Yeah. I, I really thought I had disappointed like everyone in my life, everyone who'd been watching my story, everyone who'd been cheering me on. Like I thought it's I crazy how down. we like internalize these things to have this perspective where like logically, like, you know, if someone came to you and didn't do something well, like, you know, you wouldn't criticize them hard. Yeah. You wouldn't be like, oh, you, you suck. But for ourselves, when we don't deliver to what we want to deliver, we think other people are going to think that, like, be mad at us, be yeah. disappointed. But naturally, 
most of the time that's not really the case on how anybody ever really treats people they care about yeah. um it's just it's just kind of trippy to, to think that like that was something that you actually thought would happen mm-hmm. but it's not really a rational thought. Yeah, because I guess like I, I haven't really thought about it in that perspective before where if someone came up to me and said, hey, Janice, you know, I, I've been telling you that I was going to go to the Olympics. Like I didn't make it. I wouldn't be like, what the hell? Yeah. Like, I can't believe you are. <laughs> I would have I'd be like, Supportive. oh, man, yeah. like that sucks. You know, I was looking forward to seeing you there, but I know you did. I know you tried. Yeah. Like you got the next one. Like I would not have been mad right. or disappointed. And that's how mostly any situation would be in a more supportive way. Yeah. So I'm just saying like, it's, it's crazy how we, how we tend to think that it's way more extreme. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I really thought people would be upset. And so I was like, man, it's so hard that I had to deal with this disappointment myself, but now I've disappointed thousands of people. And then like, it wasn't that bad. And still like, it sucked. And like, ugh, I'm still frustrated. I didn't make it to that one, but it wasn't, the life ending yeah. situation that I thought it was. It was just another thing to, you know, pick myself back up from. So did the YouTube comments kind of, was that kind of like the first realization of like, oh, okay, it's not over. How did you get yourself into be like, okay, no, you know what? This is okay. Mm-hmm. It is something that happened. Unfortunately, not the way I wanted it to go, but it's okay. And now I can move forward. Like, how did you kind of like start to like dig yourself out of that emotional hole yeah i guess just seeing the response from people of like people confirming you know it's okay like we aren't upset with you because to me i knew like no matter what now i have to go to the next one it wasn't like a question of like am i gonna keep doing this like i knew i was gonna have to pick myself up and like get to the next one but it was like the shame and disappointment that was hard to face really yeah had me in a hard place and so i guess seeing the response that it it was fully opposite of what I expected. And then, um, you know, just realizing like, okay, like I, I still have haters. I still have doubters. I still have the people who said, see, I knew she would never make it. I knew it would never happen. I'm like, I still have people to prove wrong because Facts. I know I can do this. And this time it didn't work in my favor. I had an injury. I had some bad events. Like I had things that I tried my hardest to, to beat and conquer. And it just didn't work out, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible. Right. Like, I still know what I have in me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it sucked. Yeah. But it's what I think like time heals all wounds kind of thing. That's <laughs> a fact. That's a, like, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. It's a good one. It's a, it's facts. That's how it is. It, it is time heals all. And, uh, sometimes you just have to, you have to ride those emotions. You have to ride, you know, the, uh, the thoughts. There's, you can't speed through that process. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's important to like for people to understand like it's okay to feel down when something doesn't go your way, mm-hmm. but you can't dwell there. And also, too, most of the time, people are not gonna be upset at you for not being yeah. able to get to where you wanted to be. And even if they are, like, fuck it. Yeah, you know. I feel like the only time people would actually really be upset or disappointed in you is if you just quit on it like if you're saying like oh i'm trying to i'm trying yeah. to do this thing i'm trying to do this thing and then years later they go oh what happened to that you say oh i just i gave up on it they're gonna be like why did you give up like yeah. i believed in you but if you say like you know what i tried everything i could i kept trying and and you know it didn't work out then you good know. humans are not gonna be upset at you yeah um but there are yeah. definitely like some shitty people like family even family members or friends that are kind of more like judgmental jealous type vibe where like some people do want you to lose mm-hmm. and do like see i knew you couldn't do it you know and when when people come across that, that that's even harder to deal with because then you're like you have the disappointment and then you have someone kind of rubbing it in your face yeah um well, but overall 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 the people close to you were uh, more supportive yeah that's awesome yeah well and and what i've realized like those people who like want you to fail i've kind of realized over the years with like the negativity i'd get on like youtube or with my own snowboarding that like I've never had people who are successful in their own lives or following Mm -hmm. their own dreams be negative towards me. Right. Like anyone who's actually pursuing their passion and is happy with their life, those people have always been supportive. And so I kind of made this connection like, well, the only people who are negative must not be doing what they actually want to be doing. They must be like, they probably have some sort of dream they wish they were going after, but they're too scared to do it. So they want to cut down anyone else who isn't scared to do the thing. It's like, because I, I realized like once I was out pursuing snowboard or something, I'd see on YouTube like someone with a stupid channel doing a stupid video and like 
I could leave a comment saying like, dude, you're an idiot. You should stop <laughs> making videos. But I'm like, you know what? I have no reason to tell them that. Like they're clearly doing this thing that makes them happy. So yeah. like, why would I? Yeah, what? like we, we can have a, a different taste for things. We can yeah. not like something, but that doesn't mean like you have to shit on someone. Yeah, and that's and I think like once you're in a place where you're actually happy with what you're doing, even you if you don't have time for other people like to, to shit yeah, on other people. Yeah, and even if someone else is doing something that like you're not into, it's a different taste. It's like you're like, why would I cut them down? That's their thing. They're mm -hmm. enjoying it. Like I'm in my lane enjoying my thing. Yeah. So like I and so I realize like these these people who are negative or want to tear you down don't want you to succeed. They're unhappy with their own lives. So why would you spend any time of day facts like letting them affect you yeah happy to hear that like these losses have not been full-on defeats you're still going and what's the process now now we're in 2022 <laughs> what, what's uh how are you with snowboarding i know you got surgery like a couple months ago so kind of what what's that process now like yeah that what situation um, are you that in? pain that i was in for like four years um finally i i didn't really want to make a deal of it before this olympics because i was like i just have to go to the Nib olympics like f my knee like i'm gonna ignore this pain again um so after this february i finally i went and saw some doctors and i finally found one who found out the hardware that they put in my knee like the screw and the buttons that they had like attaching the ligament to my so knee. So from the first surgery, they put... from Well, so that knee surgery in 2018, that was my second one. Um, oh, snaps. Yeah, yeah, I had blown out my knee. Before? Prior. <laughs> yeah. It's been... My knee has been not on my team. When did they put the screws in you? Um, the first so or second? So the screws were from the second one, and they didn't get them, like, flush against my bone. It, they were kind of, like, sticking out a bit. Oh, wow. And so this doctor was able to determine that when I was getting those pains it was tendon getting like caught, caught on the underneath screw. the screw yeah so mm. it, it would get caught and i'd move a certain way and that tendon would slip underneath and pinch and ah. that pinch was the knife you know and um i was like really i've seen i've i had seen doctors and gone x-rays and stuff over the last three years and nobody figured that out nobody could tell this doctor's like yeah it was pretty obvious like it's it's getting caught in there i'm like all right. So he was like, well, we'll do a cortisone shot because also he he had suggested or another doctor had suggested a cortisone shot last fall. But with the Olympics, like what does that dopings, do? um, it's it's just like a really strong anti-inflammatory type of painkiller. Like I think there's some like steroid type of. But that doesn't fix the thing. screw. No, it would have just like taken the pain away. Oh. And um, they didn't. Well, I chose to not do it in the fall because with the Olympics, like anti-doping drug testing uh, rules, yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't want like, to get mixed yeah. in with anything. Um, so we did the cortisone shot in my knee. It was great for a month. There were things where I could feel like my knee, a moment where it would be like, oh, my knee would want to twinge here and it didn't. And I'm like, wow, this feels good. And then after a month, it kind of wore off. I was getting the pains again. I was like, all right, like, I guess we take these out. Um, so yeah, so we took all the little screws and everything out of my. Wait, knee. so they took the screws out, but yeah. the, the screws weren't necessary to stay in you. No, no, yeah, they. Um, <laughs> so why were the screws in the first place? It was basically just to like make sure the the ligament, the new ACL, like stayed in as it was healing. So, but now you're healed up enough that yeah. they can take the screws out. Yeah, and now they, you just have holes in there. Yeah, they said it's like fully like formed my bone. So actually, I just had my my follow up appointment where we did another X ray, and you can still see previously in the x-rays you could see the screw in my knee in the x-ray like clear as day and i thought the bone was going to fill back in but in this x-ray i just got you can see a hole in my bone that's literally shaped like the screw you can see the thread of the screw in my knee and it's and there's no screw there it's just the hole that's yeah. in my bone that's and it's like, not going to heal ah, i mean i think it's going to heal one day why didn't that's crazy <laughs> but yeah so that's why but so i finally got wow. that out um yeah, I don't know where we were going with this one. Uh, no, so I was, uh, no, no. I, I mean, I don't mind going off tangent a little bit to get into those details. That's crazy. But no, uh, my question was, um, now what what situation are you in with the the twenty twenty two Olympics? Right. Yeah. Okay. So so my knee is figured out. That's where we're starting with. Knee is figured out. Um, I'm here living in L. A. Um, Which you just did. For the first yeah, time. I just moved down here because, like I was saying, senior year of high school when I go do I follow acting or snowboarding as I can always go back to acting. And so I'm like, all right, this is my chance to get into it. My plan was to like, quote unquote, retire from snowboarding after the 2022 Olympics. Um, but really, 
Yeah, I just, I because there's so many other facets of snowboarding that I like. Like when I started, it wasn't to be a competitive snowboarder. I kind of end up going that route, but I want to film, like do a street part, maybe yeah. film some big mountain, travel the world and just go to different resorts because right now I only travel to where there's half pipes. So I want to do the other things and enjoy yeah. other parts of snowboarding. And um, for like 10 years, I've just been fully competition. in the competition thing. And um, so I wanted to kind of be done with that but this one coach who is a very famous pro snowboarder, Danny Cass, um, he is he was coaching my friend this year. And last summer, he saw me do, I think, a back seven. And he was like, oh, are you going to go to nine? And I was like, no, I'm like, I can't do nine. He's like, yeah, you can do a nine. Like, you look set to, like, go for a nine from there. I'm like, I'm like can I do a nine? And I was like, man. Tony Hawk did a nine. Like, <laughs> I want to do a nine. Like, that's a really, really like solid thing to like when I'm, you know, 60 years old or 70 years old and someone's yeah, like, oh, you used like to you snowboard. I go, I did a 900 back in my day. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. a very solid accomplishment. Hell yeah. Um, you know, like, okay, I went to Olympics. Well, how do you qualify? Like, or like, how do you quantify that? What was your best trick? What did you? Oh, I did a 900. So I wanted to do this 900 and he got in my head and I had never considered doing a nine. And I was like, he thinks I could do a nine? He sees that I, I could do a nine out of this. Like, huh? So I've been thinking about it all season. My plan at the Olympics was to land my first run, just put my first run down. And then second run, I was going to go balls to wall. I was going to come in as fast as I could, do a big air. And then I was just going to go for the nine second hit. And I hadn't actually like tried a nine, but I was like, oh man, I'm going to be there at the Olympics. It's going to be game time. I've done other tricks for the first time in competition right. just because I'm like, like my first ever 720 was in a pipe competition wow. and I didn't try it at all front seven. I never tried it in the practice because my thought was if I try and practice and I don't land, I'm going to lose confidence. I'm going to be thinking, oh, maybe I'm not going to land it. But if I never try it, as far as I know, I might land it first try. <laughs> That's crazy. So I was like, well, I'll just go for it. So like my front seven, it was in a competition. I'd land my first run. I go, how do I step this up? All right. I turn a five into a seven. And I had the adrenaline. It was game time. Judges were watching. Boom, threw it. And I landed a seven. I'm like, whoa. That's so amazing. I had the same idea for the nine where I'm like, I'm just going to set myself up for it really good. And I am just going to go balls to wall. And also like, if I get terribly wrecked on this, like it's in the Olympics. Like I got it's a good dope shot. Way to get like, yeah, it's a know, dope way like, to get wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> like it, everyone sees the sick fail. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go for this. And then That's my crazy. first run was like so sketchy. I was, I things were going on. I was not riding how I wanted to do. There was like three different moments in the run where like I almost stayed it and I just hung on for dear life and like stayed on my feet. And my last hit I finally fell. I went down and I'm sitting there at the bottom of the pipe at the Olympics like, oh my God, I fell in my run. Like, And we only get two runs. Yeah. So I was like, well, now what do I do? I was planning on landing that run and then, then balls to the wall. doesn't matter what happens in the second one. And so I kind of like had to weigh the options of, well, do I land a run or do I go for this? If I go for this and don't land, then I just leave the Olympics with not even a landed run here. Like, mm -hmm. And so... I decided to just land a run, finish a run on my feet. So I never got to go for the nine. And now I can't quit snowboarding or I can't quit competing because I never got to do the 900. Yeah, yeah you, you, you got to do it. You have to. <laughs> so I'm stuck and I've got to do it. How, how did you feel in the uh, with the Olympic performance? Um, you know, the other thing was like, I felt like I didn't really ride how I wanted to. I... I went into it saying no matter how I finish, if I'm like proud of the run I do, if I ride out feeling like that was a great run, that was like the best I could do, I'll be You'd happy be with myself. Yeah. yeah. And I rode out thinking that was not the best I could do. Like it was not the best I had done. I had done better, better runs in other competitions even. Why do you, why, if you don't mind me asking, like what was the thing that made it not be a great run for you? <laughs> you know what? Like sometimes you just, don't land your tricks perfectly and okay so but um, you, it wasn't um the run selection it was just no, like the sketchiness maybe yeah yeah i just oh, okay, i okay. didn't do the tricks right i i had switched um to like a backup board the board i was supposed to compete on like i wasn't 
feeling right on it spinning. So I went to my backup that was like a three or four year old board. Damn. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna ride this one. It's not as fast. It didn't have like as much like uh, stiffness for for the speed or the power, yeah. but I felt better spinning. So I was like, well, I wanna land the tricks. And the other one, I can go bigger and go faster, but I feel weird spinning on it. So yeah. it was like last minute kind of day of change. And yeah, I just, I didn't do the runs how I wanted and like how I knew I could do it. It wasn't like, oh, yeah. I wish I could have ran better. It was like all these tricks I know I have done better and yeah. can do better um but you did get a solid run i i landed one yeah yeah yeah, yeah i put got, it down i i did my run was front seven cab three air back five front five back seven yeah. um damn so i i did a, i did a run yeah. but i wanted to do better and i wanted to like show the world what I had been working on for yeah. like 12 years of my life. I wanted to show like, yeah. yes, all this time I've spent, this is what I've been working on. And I didn't really get to do that. So I'm like, oh man, am I competing for another four years? Like I got, <laughs> I got to do this nine. I got to show people that I can really send it. I got to see the nine. <laughs> let, let me know when you're doing the nine. I want to go see it. I want to go see it in person. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to be Tony Hawk out there. You know, That's right. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> the inspiration. Yeah. Now, is your thought to save the 900 for the Olympics <laughs> or are you just going to go and do the 900 for a part? No, I think I think I'm just going to start going for it. Yeah. Um, Ricky kind of pointed out like, why do you because I was like, I don't want to compete, but I need to do this. Nine. He's like, why do you have to do it in a competition? Like, why yeah. don't you just do it for like a YouTube video? You know, do it for yourself. Even he's like, yeah. he's like, why don't you just do it or for do yourself? it in your part? Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, like, I guess I don't need to. It's just I know the mentality I have when I'm training for a competition that like do or die. Like this is the yeah. moment you have to go for it. There's no I'll come back and do it tomorrow. And I think I need that mentality of like, like you have no choice but to do this right now. But I think I'll 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 work on it. I I want to just. I feel like if I put down some sevens that are good, my my thing is like I've always struggled with amplitude and like I land my sevens literally at coping height. Like I literally only like right as there. high as the coping. I get as high as the coping, I can do a seven. So I'm like, man, if I get two feet out, I know I can get a nine. So it's like, it's a very realistic thing in my head where it's like, I know I can do it. And- Is it like, you get nervous about it? Like kind of, is it scary? Not, not the back nine. Because the rotation from back seven to back nine is kind of like a open shoulder rotation where you can cheat it. If you get like eight thirty, you can slide, you can slide it. Slide it. Yeah. yeah, front side it's like a whole shoulder, like your whole body has to turn around for the extra one. But I'm like, man, if I just over rotate a seven, like even if I just go for <laughs> over rotating a seven, like I think I can do it. So I'm excited to do it. I want to do it. I just have to figure out when now. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm living here in LA, and, yeah, and I want to go about like if I go to this next Olympics, I am going into it a totally different way than I have. Where like previously, I'm snowboarding ten months a year, and I'm just riding pipe. I'm riding pipe, riding pipe, riding pipe every single day. Like same thing. And I look back at the last four years, and I feel like the ten months of riding a year, like I find footage from 2017. I'm like my run there, like I was doing tricks just as good there as I did this year. Like, but I trained so hard so many days and I don't know if there's a whole bunch, a lot of a change. Mm. And, um, you know, that phrase that like insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yeah. I'm like, well, I've been doing the same thing. I've been training that way and nothing really happened. So like maybe this time I skateboard a bunch, you know, I'm skating. I start skating transition. Uh, I went to a tumbling class. I did a, my first like front flip on the ground the other day. I'm Sick. like, okay, if I learn some tumbling, do skating, maybe rock climb, maybe mountain bike, do all sorts of other things. Maybe then I turn up to the pipe and I only ride half pipe for like a week before a competition. And maybe all those other things I've done actually make my half pipe right. riding better like i don't know but the same way i've been I mean, training at bare minimum worked. even if it doesn't help improve it at least you have a bunch of dope memories and yeah. adventures that you've lived throughout the time to get to that place so like yeah. you could do a bunch of other stuff so i mean life-wise that sounds awesome yeah and that's and that's the thing too is i felt like my whole life for 10 12 years has just been in this single pursuit mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things i've sacrificed there's right. so many things that i haven't gotten to do that i really wanted to but i was like i can't like I have to like, everything's going towards this finish line. Everything's going towards that. Yeah. Like, and so 
after spending that time, like my entire 20s from 18 to I'm 29 now, like my entire 20s were on this one thing. And so I want to do these other things while I'm still yeah. young. There's so much other stuff right, that right. I want to do. So I don't want to miss out on them, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think you could do the 900 outside of competition. <laughs> like, even if you don't, like, you could you could do it in a part, or you can even just do it as, like, a production of just that for, like, like you know, more than just vlogging it. Mm -hmm. Maybe get, like, multicams, get, like, make it this whole thing yeah. where, like, all right, today's a day I land my 900 and make it into, like, this super dope, like, 10-minute video yeah. that's just, like, all about this big accomplishment of yours. Yeah. That could be really dope. That'd be, I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> yeah let me know all right link will be in the description no that's right not yet <laughs> yeah it's for soon in um, a few months <laughs> so now acting you've been in theater since you were a kid yeah i uh i i so i got my first agent when i was like three years old and i'd go out for auditions for different tv shows or movies or commercials or whatever in elementary school i'd get picked up you know from school early for a dentist appointment um, <laughs> that really was like an audition in the city yeah. and, um so i had fun doing that and i always did theater like all of my school's productions i did some theater outside of school just like regular professional theater community theater and, and now in theater is it mostly act is it only acting or are you singing as well singing and dancing yeah so i had like singing lessons that i took as a kid dance lessons um i did everything i actually grew up as a competitive figure skater you know my family was in the figure skating business you and, were a figure skater as well yes yeah, so oh, wow. my my first figure skating like competition i was like 15 months old and i did that what? until the end of high school but i did that i did cheerleading i did gymnastics i did yeah dancing singing what else did i do i think i did like any sort of sport or activity that wow. came my way i that's awesome i like to do i kind of i feel like my life has been the um the jack of all trades master of none well, do you know the full quote oh wait yes there is more to it yes yes it's something like a jack of all trades is a master of none but oftentimes better than a master of one I actually have my business cards right there. That's on my business cards. Really? Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. I can do, I can be average or better, or better than, than average, average at many, many things. Yeah. Which would be the yeah. full quote. Yeah. 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 Well, and and I think like, I, and I see that my background in doing so much, so many different things comes out when um, like there was an acting job a few years ago. I was on uh, American Pie, the new American mm -hmm. Pie movie that came out. Um, they needed like high school girls on the lacrosse team. Yeah. And um, because the characters were in the lacrosse team. And so it was lacrosse or field hockey. It might have been field hockey, but it was one of those. I think lacrosse. And I they they need people with real lacrosse experience. And I said, yeah, I can play lacrosse. I, I was on my high school's lacrosse team, which I wasn't. But <laughs> I've done enough different sports and activities that, that I can, can pick it up. I can pick up any ball or stick or anything and like, yeah do it yeah do it decently and i think that's just because i have such a large background and stuff that yeah. like if if i someone only trained in one specific sport their whole life now they have a different apparatus and it's like what do i do with that yeah. thing so. i think that's awesome like i love like i said that quote the full quote is like i live by that yeah. because i don't want to just be like there i have so many interests i have so many passions mm -hmm. that like i don't want to just limit myself and put myself in a box like I have some friends that are just focused on the one thing. And if that's fulfilling for them, that's awesome. Fucking yeah. great. But just my mindset's not like that. My mm -hmm. mindset, I, I, I like this, I like this. And like, I want to go hard in all of them. Um, and I think that that's really dope. So it, it's awesome that you did all those things growing up. And I think it's yeah. awesome that you continue, you want to continue doing so many different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like that, uh, you know, you can continue to compete. You can continue to do these things in snowboarding. But yeah, there is so much more to, to life that you can mm -hmm. not only experience, but achieve as well. Yeah. Um, so you grew up acting, musical theater, all that stuff. Did everything as a kid. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I used to like beg my parents when I was in third grade to move the family to Los Angeles. I was like, please move us to Los <laughs> Angeles so I can act. Like I want more jobs because San Francisco had a film industry, but like LA has LA always been spot. where it's been. Yeah. So I used to beg my parents to move the family here and they, and now you're here. Yeah, now I'm here. Now I did it myself. Wow. But um, yeah, I've, I've had and, fun. And you're starting to do that more now. Mm -hmm. You're actively pursuing it more now, right? Like yeah. Like you're starting to do it more? Yeah, okay. now that I'm here, it's like I can I can really start go for it and, and mm -hmm. figure out how to do it and what to do. Um, it's kind of like 
I feel like when I jumped into snowboarding at 18 and I had to figure out the whole industry myself and like figure out like, okay, what are the events? Who are the people I'm supposed to know? What are the things that I go to? Where do I train? How do I make a career? And I had to learn it all myself. I kind of feel like I'm like at that place in acting and entertainment where it's like, I'm here now. I want to do this. Okay. Like I'm figuring out what, like what are all the pieces are that I do, need to doing do. Doing all this that you just explained in snowboarding. Did you encounter a lot of shadiness? Because the LA acting scene is horrendously shady. So I'm just wondering. Um, uh, I know a lot of industries have shady people, um, but just just wondering if you encountered anything shady or like people trying to take advantage of people in snowboarding. It's Well, it'd be a, a whole nother conversation for another day, but there are certain people who try to take advantage of women in snowboarding. Uh, and that was something I had to learn about. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I, I, I don't mean that. Yeah, they're just horrible fucking, especially dudes who try to take advantage of their power. You want to get um, on the team? You want some product? Like, that's the fucking worst piece of shit. <laughs> I hate that. Pursuing film out here, it's like there are like a lot of fake agents, a lot of fake mm -hmm. uh, 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 managers, a lot of, you know, this and that. Like, oh, well, I got to take all this percentage from you or, oh, yeah, I'll get you on this. And then they don't pay you or they, you know, it's a lot of shadiness. It's just. Yeah, there's not really so much of that. And I think because it's a much smaller community and smaller industry where like here in L.A., you can say like, oh, yeah, like I'm this great manager. I repped all these people, these people. And you don't know. There's no one to like verify. Yeah. But oh, look at, look at the picture I have with such and such. Yeah. And it's like they just met them at a party and like four them into a photo like yeah. that's my homie like no, and it's in, not. in snowboarding you can ask anyone in the industry like hey do you know who Rand be like, nah. randy kirk is and they go no we don't know who that is that is that person yeah. has nothing to do with the industry um there is some like clickiness where it's like there's certain circles if you're yeah. part of those circles then you get some opportunities or right. like the magazines only want to show certain yeah. people they like for this or that reason um so there's some of that but yeah i think like the acting industry, it's a lot different. That's something I've I've tried to deal with with finding an acting class that every single acting class I look up, they go, oh, we are the top acting mm. class in Los Angeles. We, we've had all of these famous people come through. I'm like, well, okay, all of these acting schools or classes can't be the best. So I know they're all feeding me lies. Yeah. But as a like new person, as you know, with what's it, green? I'm green feet green. or something. Yeah. yeah. Like, like it's, yeah, you're I a can't novice, like you don't know yeah, any I better can't yet. Suss out yeah. which ones are the shady ones, but like yeah. I know some of them are. Yeah. And so yeah, it's Yeah, there's a lot of tough. trial and error here. But I will say, like, if you're getting a gut feeling that you're not sure about something, just stop it. working with that person or that group of people. It, it, it's it's crazy. I, I like I don't like a lot of the industry out here, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, but once you find like the good people, then you know the good people keep other good people in their circles yeah. which is well, dope and and i think what we were talking about earlier with like failing and like being hurt getting injured like you don't ever have failures that are that bad here we're like i look at it like oh if i go out to like a hundred auditions and i don't book a role or something like it's it's failing over and over again but it's not painful yeah yeah, yeah. it may be like a little spiritually painful or emotionally painful right. but like i'm not like limping back right, home right. because yeah, i yeah. missed another audition you can still go to your 101th <laughs> yeah uh, so i feel like after dealing with so much like physical pain and like stress on my body yeah. yeah after all of the like physical and bodily stress i'm like well failing here at least isn't painful <laughs> yeah yeah i'm excited for for that part of your journey now and uh, I'm looking forward to your 900 <laughs> and all the other things. Um, we got to get you on the podcast again, maybe in the next several months, kind of uh, talk more about all the other stuff too. Because uh, you're doing a lot of things. Like, it's amazing. So I'm looking forward to what you're going to do, do in the next few months. You have a YouTube channel yes. uh, with your own content. And then you and Ricky Glazer have a couple's <laughs> YouTube channel you guys just started. Yeah. And how's that? Yeah, well, we kind of wanted, so we moved in together down here and um, we thought about having a place where he we can do stuff that isn't necessarily like typical of our own channels where like Ricky's only going to be doing skate content and skate related in things his on channel, his. Yeah. yeah, like he's not going to be renovating furniture right. like weekend in uh, on date weekend or something like that. And like <laughs> yeah. mine is a little bit, more Vlogging? just about my life yeah. yeah it's it's kind of more open to other things but i still try to keep it within like action sports and exciting um but we're like oh a couple's channel we can do like 
plain anything you want plain truth or yeah. dare like expose series do some of that like viral kind yeah. of fun stuff that's just so different than what we normally do yeah so yeah so that's cool because yeah. then it's like some an, like it's also like it's content because you know you guys are in this social media platform uh, uh career i mean you're, you guys have careers that were social media mm-hmm. social media platforms are like pivotal mm-hmm. so you have to create content consistently regardless um but now you're able to create content together but then also too with the couple's uh youtube channel like there's no specific direction you have to stay in so mm-hmm. you can just have fun yeah that sounds like an activity but it's also fun that sounds awesome yeah and we saw like a lot of couples channels are super successful like there's a lot of huge couples channels on on youtube and on the other platforms um and there's no like two professional athletes or like extreme at sports athletes in a relationship doing That's like sick. couples chance are like oh we've got this other thing where we can do yeah like we can do the mainstream stuff but then we could also be like oh we both like did something crazy you That's know dope. i don't know like there's yeah, there's yeah. more stuff that there's we a can lot do. of appeal there it's, it's really dope i like when i see two good people come together and then create and just have good vibes and so i enjoy being around them i enjoy your vibes when you're mm-hmm. around and uh thank you for being on the podcast thank i appreciate the conversation me. it was really dope i'm looking forward to everything that you're about to do <laughs> um everything from your snowboarding to acting to everything else so uh yeah it's it's really exciting stuff let people know where they can find you yeah, I'm on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, pretty much anything is at Janice Spiteri. And yeah, you find me there. I share everything, a lot of <laughs> stuff. I'm always on social media. And yeah, and then I kind of do some different things on the different platforms. platforms. Yeah, like I might tweet about something that I'm not going to be showing on Instagram or I might be answering something that's like not ever going to be on YouTube. So you got to follow me on all of them. Smart, <laughs> smart. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for coming through and thank you guys yeah. for watching. Catch you guys on the next one. Peace.